Hi, this is Dr. Fox. Let's talk about the osteology of the superior mediastinum and the root of neck. So the thorax is a bony cage that surrounds the thoracic cavity. The osteological elements include 12 thoracic vertebrae, so T1 is below that line and obscured by the remainder of the skeleton. T12 is there. And these vertebrae articulate with 12 pairs of ribs. So the first rib is there, the second is there, so on and so forth. The 11th and 12th ribs are there. You'll notice that the ribs articulate with the sternum, which is this osteological element here, the acostal cartilages, this is hyaline cartilage, all but the last two ribs, which we call floating ribs. Now, the sternum is tripartite. It consists of a manubrium, a body, and a xiphoid process. The superior portion of the manubrium has a concavity. This is called the suprasternal notch, also known as the jugular notch, and that's a palpatable landmark. That's a useful landmark for helping to, uh, to measure out the cervical region. There's also the sternal angle. That's the bony angle between the manubrium, which is canted posteriorly, and the body. And that's going to be a very useful landmark for establishing the thoracic plane. The thoracic plane runs between that sternal angle and the intervertebral disc between T4 and T5. The portion of the mediastinum superior to the thoracic plane is the superior mediastinum. The remainder of the mediastinum, so the anterior, the middle, and the inferior are all inferior to, or I'm sorry, the posterior, are all inferior to the thoracic plane. Now between the ribs are the intercostal spaces. Because there are 12 ribs, there are only 11 intercostal spaces, and the intercostal spaces are all named for the rib that is at the superior border. So for instance, this is rib one, and this is the first intercostal space, rib two, and the second intercostal space, and so on and so forth, down to the 11th intercostal space. Below the level of the cartilage that attaches the inferior ribs to the xiphoid process, we have the costal margin or arch, which is palpatable. Do you feel free to feel your own? Um, this costal margin represents the anterior and the lateral attachment site for the diaphragm, which is the muscular division between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity, which is the main engine behind ventilation. And finally, before we move on, it's probably worth noting that it's right about at that sternal angle that the second ribs are going to articulate with the sternum. So the second ribs are really the, uh, the first pair of truly palpatable ribs. The reason being is that the first ribs are obscured from palpation by the clavicles. The clavicles, colloquially called the collarbones, are a part of the shoulder joint, and they are the only physical osteological joint or arthrosis between the upper limb and the remainder of the axial skeleton. The first rib is a very interesting looking rib. It's very superior inferiorly compressed. It's very flat, especially distally towards where it's 
costal cartilage would attach. We can see the head of the first rib there. There's the tubercle, so this would be the neck. And then when we think about the root of the neck, our minds should go to the anterior scalene muscle. The anterior scalene is the key to the root of the neck. It's the thing that establishes all of the relationships. And the tubercle for the anterior scalene is right there. That's called the scalene tubercle. That bone is raised because of the tension that the anterior scalene puts on the bone. So osteoblasts will deposit matrix under tension or pressure. And as a result, a tubercle is formed. Now anterior to that tubercle is a groove. And that groove is for the subclavian vein. Posterior to that tubercle is another groove, and that groove is for the subclavian artery. And so this is going to help you to remember the classic anatomical relationships among these structures, where at the root of the neck, the subclavian vein is really encountered first. It's the most anterior structure. That's probably a good thing because it offers good venous access. Posterior to the subclavian vein, we would have the anterior scalene muscle. Riding down upon that would be the phrenic nerve entering into the superior thoracic inlet. And then posterior to that will be the subclavian artery, the roots of the brachial plexus, and then we would have where the middle scalene muscle attaches. And then the posterior scalene muscle will miss the first rib entirely and attach to the second rib. And then finally, Ribs are going to have what are known as subcostal or just costal grooves. If we look on the inferior margin, we have this slight rolling concavity. It's within this subcostal groove that we are going to find the neurovascular bundle. And that neurovascular bundle located in that groove will first consist of the intercostal vein, then the intercostal artery, and then finally, the intercostal nerve. So the relative order of structures will go vein, artery, nerve, van going down. So that's for the main intercostal bundle. Keeping in mind that at the inferior margin of the intercostal space, we'll also have the collateral bundle. And with that collateral bundle, which is very small, We'll have the collateral vein, collateral, collateral artery, and then collateral nerve. So again, when we look at this, we'll have NAV. So remember that the veins are always closest to the ribs. Thank you very much for your time.